Hello and welcome to the News Minute. India announced on December 2nd that two people have been detected with the Omicron variant. While one was a South African national who's gone back to South Africa, the other is a doctor from Bengaluru. According to new evidence collected in South Africa by its National Institute for Communicable Diseases, the data suggests that Omicron can evade immunity from infection with earlier variants and is causing reinfections at three times the previous rates. So how concerned should India be? What should India's strategy be? Is lockdown the only way forward? What should India do to discuss this and more? I'm joined by top virologist, Dr. Gagandeep Kang. But before I go to the interview, I want to just tell you, remember to support independent journalism. Do become a member of the News Minute. The link is in the description below. And of course, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you for joining the News Minute. My first question is, India has announced uh, two patients or two people have been detected with Omicron. Perhaps there are others too, because as far as the Bengaluru man goes, five of his contacts too have tested positive. What is your first reaction uh, to India's announcement? That I'm not surprised. Um, because given the fact that this seems to be a variant that was identified and grew quite rapidly in terms of the numbers in South Africa. And we have a reasonable amount of travel from the African continent to India. It, I'm not surprised that there are cases here. Similarly, there have been cases in Europe, the US, etc. cetera. Um, the fact that the person from Bangalore had no travel history just underlines the fact that this variant may have been around in India for a few weeks. So I think as we sequence more, we'll find more. And the important thing for us to be doing is to be trying to make sure that we understand what this means for the future. I mean, for a virus, what matters? What matters is how much it spreads, uh, how severe is the disease that it causes, and what can we do to protect people from severe disease by either people who have been previously infected or people who have been previously vaccinated. So at least in terms of first category, how much it spreads, I think it's evident that it's spreading. It's delta or more than delta. And that's fine. We can deal with the virus that spreads with testing and making sure we have a sense of how easily it spreads. At the moment, we are hearing that it's causing mostly mild or asymptomatic infections because it's being picked up in travelers who are screened or people who are tested because they have mild illness. There are no reported deaths, but I think that is not something we should think that the last word has been written on, because we are still talking about relatively small numbers of detected infections. And as we have more infections detected, we will get a clearer sense of what the clinical spectrum really looks like. And then the last one, what you pointed out, which is protection from infection or the ability to cause reinfections. Again, I'm not worried about reinfections. All coronaviruses will reinfect. As long as the reinfections are mild, that's not something for us to worry about. What we need to worry about is if people who have not been vaccinated or people who have uh, you know, been infected, in them, what happens? Can you get severe disease in them? And I don't think we have data to tell us about that right now. If I could go back to the earlier point of the fact that the person from Bengaluru did not have any travel history. And I read a story uh, today morning in a newspaper, I think the Deccan Herald, where the hospital where he was working in was quoted and they said uh, there's very less chance that he met someone with a travel history to any of the countries which have already reported Omicron. What does that mean? That essentially means exactly what I said, that the virus variant may have come into the country weeks ago. And there be, may be more of it than we realize until we get 
PCR data with the S gene dropout, or we get sequence data, it's not possible for us to say how much of the variant we might already have in the country. The critical thing right now is to make sure that we try and identify how much we have and correlate that with severity and vaccination status of the individuals that are infected. So uh, since South Africa is saying that uh, this is more transmissible, to the audience, can you explain why is this variant more transmissible? Is it because of the mutations on it? So when we look at viruses, um, SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor. And the original Wuhan version of the virus did not bind particularly well to the ACE2 receptor compared to the viruses that came after. The first mutation we saw was one called D614G, and that allowed for better binding. And essentially that, we didn't call it a variant at that time, but it took over essentially, and we don't have the ancestral Wuhan version of the virus anymore. Then we had the alpha variant, which bound even better. And that was because of specific mutations on the spike group. For Delta, we had a different set of mutations, some shared, some not, again, allowing Delta to bind better and spread better. So why do viruses become more transmissible? They become more transmissible if they can bind better to receptors. So imagine if you have a molecule that you want to bind to, right? Here's your molecule, here's the binding. If it's a loose binding, the virus will fall off. If it's a tight binding like that, the virus will hang on. The tighter the binding gets, the more likely that the virus will hang on and get inside the cell. So what we've seen is that the mutations are leading to better binding, which means that viruses have a greater opportunity to get in and set up an infection. So basically the virus is also learning on how to mutate better and to bind better, which means this, could, this may not even be the last variant that we'll see perhaps the next variant will bind even better, right? I mean, my understanding of what you said. It's possible. So, you know, uh, the, way the spike protein has a lot of different um, molecules on its surface. And every mutation creates an opportunity to bind better. Some mutations are relevant mutations. They result in better binding. Other mutations uh, don't matter so much. And what the virus is trying to do is figure out which is the relevant mutations, the ones that allow for better binding. And most likely, it will retain those mutations and the others might fade away. Now, the important thing to remember is that all proteins are three-dimensional structures. They are folded. So it may be that not a single mutation may be insufficient. You may need combinations of mutations in order for the virus to bind better. And which is the best combination for the best fit? We'll have to wait and see if the virus figures that out. Uh, but as long that. as, you know, it, infection doesn't really matter so much. Mm. What matters is once it infects, what does the virus do? And as long as our immune system is capable of handling what the virus does after it infects, we don't need to be as worried about just infection. Okay. So which means you are talking about severity of illness. So some of the mm -hmm. initial estimates suggest that most of the cases in South Africa have been mild. But these cases are also of young patients. So do you think we need more data and time before we can conclusively say how uh, dangerous or lethal this virus, this variant is? Absolutely. So there are just based, you know, why is everybody so concerned? If it was a single mutation, would we be so concerned? Everyone is concerned because there are so many mutations in this particular variant. 
there are over 50 mutations and in the spike protein alone, over 20 of them are mutations that are not seen in other variants. That's why people are worried. The scientists who analyze these things have looked at the mutations, uh, done computer modeling on them and shown that these mutations may be responsible for increased transmission and increased immunity. So that combination of mutations makes the virus theoretically very worrying, but the ultimate confirmation has to come from data in people. And that's what we are awaiting. As you said, early data indicate mild infection, but it is in younger people. So is that a confounding factor? We'll only be able to say when we have more cases. Uh, and I'm talking now thousands of cases rather than tens or hundreds. Hmm. So the initial data does suggest that previous infection does not provide protection from Omicron. We have talked about that. My next question is what about vaccination? Because in the two cases that the Indian government has spoken about, the South African National and the doctor from Bengaluru, both were double vaccinated, uh, but they did get the infection. So do we have any understanding about how vaccination works on this variant? At the moment, we have no understanding of how vaccination works on the variant. But if we look at how vaccination works for all variants that we have had so far, vaccination protects. It protects against the ancestral version. It protects against every variant that we have seen. It protects to varying extents but there is protection. So if we look at an unvaccinated person, we look at a doubly vaccinated person, a triply vaccinated person, and an infected person, and an infected and vaccinated person. Who is best off? Best off is the infected and vaccinated person. After that, the triply vaccinated person. After that, the doubly vaccinated Person. And worst off is the uninfected, unvaccinated person. Since, uh, since you spoke about triply vaccinated, we'll go to the next topic, which is the booster shots. What, what do you believe should India's strategy be? Because we are having more conversations about giving booster doses, perhaps first to health workers, like we did with our vaccination. You are smiling. Well, I, yeah, I think the first thing is... Can we please focus on the vulnerable groups getting their double shots? That has not happened. I find it absolutely incredible that the over 60s, who are our most vulnerable population, actually have the same or lower coverage than younger age groups. We know age is a determining risk factor. We need to make sure that elderly people in our country are doubly vaccinated. And I'm not seeing a special focus on that. Okay. Now, that's what should be ideal, what should have been focused on from the early days. But if we talk about who should get boosters and when should people get boosters, then again, the boosters need to go to the elderly first. The boosters, you know, healthcare workers in general, in employment, are young and relatively healthy people. So to me, it's not clear that healthcare workers need to be our first priority population. I think it should be the elderly for two doses and for three doses. Now, the question of pragmatism, we will never get to, let's say we will never get to cover the entire country's over 60 population with two doses. At what stage do we introduce boosters? Should we set a goal? Should we say as soon as we have 70% of over 60s doubly vaccinated, we will then switch to giving boosters to anybody over 60 that wants them? Or should it be 50%? You know, I don't think it should be 30% doubly vaccinated over 60s and we start booster doses. But I think we need to set a stretch goal and say from this point on, we will consider boosters. And we haven't really done that as a matter of 
So what you're saying is that for India to combat the variant and if these cases do increase, we have to up our game as far as vaccinating the elderly population goes, right? As a priority, absolute. So the population overall, but with a special focus on the most vulnerable. And what should India's testing strategy be? What should we be looking at now? I think we should be looking at rapid antigen tests much more. So the rapid antigen tests will not tell us whether we are infected with variants or not, but they will give us responses to whether people are infected or not quite quickly. So I think one of the ways to approach this is to think about strategies that can be applied for where identifying infected individuals really matters. So now suppose you're looking at schools and you want to stop transmission in schools. In schools, I would suggest that if you're having classes and you detect an infection within a class, it makes much more sense to quickly do a rapid screen on everybody and say that if we identify transmission within the class, then we send the class home for a while. Okay, but essentially we need to look at scenarios and figure out what the appropriate strategies are for that scenario and introduce either rapid antigen test followed by PCR or PCR itself, depending on what our goals are and the actions that will be taken following a detection of a case. So you are saying that if a case is de detected, then look at the cluster itself, the people around the contacts, do a rapid antigen and then RT-PCR. But our first reaction is always banning travel, restricting travel and locking down again for example my son started school just two weeks ago and it's shut again from next monday so my happiness is just evaporated he cannot go back to school should that be the first reaction to this variant also no so that's why i'm saying that detection of individual cases should not necessarily lead to shutting down an educational facility. What do you want to prevent in a school, right? You want to prevent children from getting really ill because children have not been vaccinated. You don't want children carrying infections home where they might be vulnerable people. So what I'm saying is if you detect one case in a school, let's say, then I would su suggest that you test all the children around that child or adult or whoever their contacts are. If you find that transmission has happened already, that group, the whole group, not just the ones that test positive, should be restricted from school so that you don't have ongoing transmission, right? If you find an isolated case that has not transmitted to anybody else, I would just tell the case, go home and come back once you've tested negative, right? So what you need is to evolve strategies that are sensible, that don't shut entire schools down because one case was if clusters are detected, that's a different story. But ma'am, though this sounds sensible and uh, non-alarming, the point is that people are again alarmed and whether it's schools or offices, there is a concern that what if there are asymptomatic cases? For example, you are saying if one case is detected, that means it's someone symptomatic and you test them. But what if there is somebody in a school or an office space who's asymptomatic and then spreads the variant or the disease itself to others unknown? That's a fear, right, which most people have which is leading to shutdown again, a lockdown again. And how will you prevent it with a shutdown? Right? It's an asymptomatic infection. Do you stop school forever? Because that's the only way of being safe. That I didn't have transmission in school because no child ever came to school. Right? You are not going to be able to stop asymptomatic transmission forever. 
the only way to do that is to stop people ever coming in contact with each other. That's not sensible. And we have to remember that if we look at risk profiles, healthy children are best able to handle the virus. So we should make sure that children with comorbidities are protected, that all adults are vaccinated. I'm not advocating for letting a virus into school and letting it run wild. That's why I'm saying if you detect a cluster, you want to slow spread down. So you isolate whoever is in or in contact with that cluster. But it's not that you shut the entire school down because there is one cluster that may not have anything to do with other classes in the school or other groups in the school. I'm going to let you go with just one or two more questions because I know that you must be getting approached for a lot of reactions. Uh, my other my continue uh, my question in continuation with what we were speaking is that so what do you think should government strategy be should then should we look beyond travel bans travel restrictions and lockdowns because that's all the conversation is even now i think lockdowns were fine when you did not have the tools that we had in the very very early days when the aim was to flatten the curve right now we are not talking about flattening the curve anymore. We have vaccines, we have drugs. We can do something if people get infected. We can do something to protect the bulk of our population from getting really sick. So we need to plan our current strategy based on the tools we have today and not the reactions that we had last year. So therefore, lockdowns make no sense. Travel bans make no sense. Testing for travel, before travel, after travel, sure, that makes sense. What are you going to achieve with that? You're going to slow the entry of new variants into your country and you will again have time to learn more about the variant and learn how to handle it. Okay, so use the tools you have develop strategies that are predictable. So people know if a new variant emerges, this is what the government strategy is going to be. Not that one city does one thing, one state does another thing, one country does one thing and another country does another thing. This makes no sense at all. People cannot function without predictability in what will happen. The virus itself is unpredictable enough. We don't need policy unpredictability as well. Well, definitely something that can do that we can do without. My uh, uh, my next question to you is that there is some fear that variant may be resistant to vaccine. So, are we also looking at a modified vaccine for this new variant? We are. I mean, Moderna and Pfizer are already working on new vaccines with the variant. But let's remember that we have been here before. There was the beta variant also from South Africa and Moderna and Pfizer made vaccines for the beta variant. They gave a booster of the new vaccine to people who had received two doses of their previous version of the vaccine and compared that to people who received a booster dose of the old vaccine. And they found that even if you gave a booster dose of the older version of the vaccine, you got a broadening of the immune response. So three doses provided better protection against the beta variant than two doses, even if you didn't give the beta variant vaccine as the booster dose. So will that happen with this variant as well? I think we'll need to wait and see. The important thing to remember is that we can make vaccines very quickly. We could have a Omicron vaccine available to us as early as February or March. And that's not very far from now. Will we need the vaccine? I don't think we can say that with any certainty at all. 
Well, that is good news that we can have a vaccine as early as February if everything goes right. My final question to you is that India has detected two cases, perhaps by the time this interview is uh, put out on my channel, uh, on TNM's channel, there will be more cases detected. Uh, there is a lot of concern, worry, but what would you have to say to anyone and everyone watching this video? Wear masks. Make sure that you're vaccinated, that everybody around you is vaccinated. Stay in well-ventilated spaces and don't fight your way through crowds. Wear masks. That's very important because I think most people have now discarded the mask. They feel that they are beyond any variant and any virus. I mean, uh, I hope people start wearing masks again. Thank you very much, Dr. Kang, for joining me in this conversation. So many takeaways, lockdowns, shutdowns are not the solution. India needs a more, uh, a better strategy for testing in place. And most importantly, we need to, uh, in a fast pace, make sure that people who are vulnerable are vaccinated in this country. So if you know people who are still not convinced about getting vaccinated, then do your job. Tell them to go get vaccinated. The government also should be doing that. Thank you very much, Dr. Kang, for all your insights.